Well, praise the Lord, everybody, and everybody, praise the Lord. Welcome to In Heavenly Places with yours truly, Elder Mark S. Brantley, and I'm glad you have tuned in to discuss a very important topic uh, in our current events and things concerning the people of God with regard to the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I know that you had a blessed uh, morning worship and afternoon worship, wherever your local assembly uh, might be. And as I always do, although I am happy and glad that you are tuning in to In Heavenly Places, I always encourage our viewers to find a local place of assembly to worship. Because yes, we can worship in our homes, we can worship uh, by ourselves, but the Bible says, forsake not the gathering of yourselves together. There's nothing like corporate worship. And I know that uh, we are post COVID and we had to shift during COVID, but now we're out of COVID and it's time for those that uh, have not gone back to their local churches it's time to make that exodus back to your church. Amen. See the people of God. Fellowship with the people of God. Amen. There uh, is nothing like corporate worship in the beauty of holiness. But at the same time, uh, I want you to keep staying tuned to In Heavenly Places where we teach and we preach the word of God. Amen. Not a whole lot of fluff, no preservatives, no additives, no fillers, but the pure word of God, according to the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Well, our topic on tonight, and uh, this is a different setting than usual. Uh, typically, uh, I'm uh, in uh, preaching mode. And even though I preach, I teach before I preach. Amen. Um, and often I say, uh, can I preach like I teach? Because um, often I like to teach to sort of establish a biblical or scriptural, scriptural predicate uh, foundation uh, before I kind of get revved up and begin preaching from the word of God. Uh, so tonight uh, we're doing a little shift and we're gonna be teaching because we need to know about what's going on in the Middle East. And our discussion and Q&A 
is Israel, Hamas, and the end times. And I, again, I think it's a very important subject matter uh, for uh, the people of God to know and understand. And you're probably um, wondering, well, why should I be concerned about what's going on in the Middle East? And my answer to you is that uh, it concerns you uh, as a believer, as a child of God, because uh, it gives us the signs as to the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, um, uh, it's important because Ty uh, the book of uh, Titus, Paul's letter to Titus tells us, uh, looking to that blessed hope and the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we don't want to be caught off guard. As a matter of fact, when we think of the end times, uh, or, or in a, a uh, theological sense, uh, the subject of eschatology, um, we look at Jesus' words, uh, which he mentioned in Matthew 24 and 25. He also um, spoke of uh, similar words in Luke, um, I believe it's in Luke chapter 21. Uh, and then you also uh, link that up with Mark 13. So when you look at Matthew 25, which is Jesus' Olivet Discourse, you also read it in conjunction with Mark uh, 13 and Luke 21, because these are synoptic gospels. Uh, both Matthew, Mark, and Luke gives us a comprehensive view of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And there are some things that Matthew focuses on that Mark doesn't, and there's some things Mark focuses on that Luke doesn't, and vice versa. So therefore, we read to study uh, the Word of God uh, in a synoptic way. And when we look at Jesus' Olivet Discourse, we look at those three passages of Scripture together. Now, Matthew 24 and 25 is often uh, a subject of confusion because individuals do not rightly divide, uh, partly because uh, there are differences in the viewpoints, especially when it comes to the rapture. Now, uh, this is not entirely about the rapture, uh, because we will start off talking about what's going on in the Middle East, but the reason why we're wanting to know what's going on in the Middle East is because these are the things that Jesus said to look for. In uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse uh, 42, Jesus gave the explicit directions to the disciples to watch, therefore. He said to watch. For you know not what hour your Lord doth come. So while we're watching, we're looking at the events uh, that are going on in our world today. And Israel is known as God's time clock because we know that Israel has to go through a period which is called Jacob's trouble. It's also known as the tribulation period, and it's also known as Daniel's 70th week. Now, you're probably wondering um, why it's called Daniel's 70th week. Uh, it's because Daniel received a prophecy from the Lord God uh, concerning uh, Israel and the end time. So let me just give a little backdrop in that regard. When um, Israel was carried away by uh, the uh, by the nation of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel uh, was given a place of authority. And uh, later on, uh, in the last days of Babylon, we know that that king, Belshazzar, defiled the vessels that were once in the temple that Solomon built. And as a result, God brought judgment. And it was it was always intended for Babylon to be overthrown because earlier in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream of a statue. And that statue is the head of had a head of gold. It had chests and arms of silver. It had belly and thighs of brass. It had legs of iron and it had feet 
mingled with iron and clay. Now, that statue represented all of the Gentile nations that were to start with Babylon and that would end with this ten-toed nation of iron and clay. This statue represents the concept that we know as the times of the Gentiles. So we know that the Gentiles must rule from Babylon until the feet of iron and clay. And then also in that dream of Nebuchadnezzar, he saw a stone, a man that was cut out uh, and the stone fell upon the feet of iron and clay and it caused the statue to topple and break into pieces. And that same stone crushed the statue into powder and the statue blew away, which means that the Gentile nations are past. And that stone then became a mountain. And that mountain represented or represents the future millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ, Jesus being the stone right? The stone that the builders rejected. That stone is now the chief at the chief corner. And it's also the stone that is going to defeat the Gentile nations. And then Jesus will ascend in authority uh, to sit on the throne of David and rule for a thousand years. Now, there's a particular timetable in regard to those things happening. Now, the times of the Gentiles is not to be confused with the fullness of the Gentiles. Now, the fullness of the Gentiles is important as well, because that concerns every believer that is in the church today. The fullness of the Gentiles refers to, um, in the Greek, I believe it's pl pleroma, uh, which means fullness. Uh, it's a, it was a naval term in ancient days pertaining to a ship. And uh, the ship, and I want to make sure I get this right, uh, the ship, uh, when it speaks of the fullness, is that the ship, when it's, before it sails, you must fill it up. It must be a full uh, ship. And Paul used that uh, description to speak of the fullness uh, of the Gentiles, meaning uh, once uh, the last saint, so to speak, uh, is in the ship, that will be when the Lord will come back for his church. Amen. Uh, and that is not to be confused with the times of the Gentiles, because the times of the Gentiles has to do with, again, the Gentile nations ruling up until the point that Jesus establishes millennial kingdom. Now, uh, what's important here is that when we talk of the fullness of the Gentiles, we're talking the fullness of the Gentiles happens when the rapture occurs because the ship is now full and then Jesus comes and raptures the church. Whereas the times of the Gentiles comes at the revelation, which is separated by the tribulation period because then Jesus comes back on his white horse at the revelation or the end of the tribulation period he comes on his white horse with the saints behind him to then topple the nations and to take his seat as king of kings and lord of lords. Now, I'm looking for that scripture uh, where Paul speaks about the fullness of the Gentiles so that I can give you the proper uh, term for the word fullness, uh, because the Greek term, because that has to do with the concept of a ship uh, being full. And it looks like I, I don't have that right now. Uh, let me see, give me a moment. Uh, let's see. Thank you, Lord. Here we are. Let's see. Fullness. Fullness. Yes. Pleroma. 
That is the Greek term for fullness. And when you do a word start study on pleroma, that uh, alludes to a ship being full. So when the ark of safety, which is the church, has reached its fullness, that will then uh, be when the Lord Jesus Christ returns at the rapture, not at the revelation. Now, what's important for us and why we watch and as well as pray is that we are looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come at the rapture. Uh, we will be with the Lord in heaven when he returns to earth at the revelation. That's at the end of the times of the Gentiles. Now, uh, it's important for us as believers to watch because the G because Jesus said he's coming as what? A thief in the night. And in order for a thief to rob you or to catch you by surprise, uh, you are either asleep or you're distracted. Uh, and Jesus is saying that he's coming as a thief because nobody knows when he's coming, right? Um, he even spoke uh, in Matthew 24 about the days of Noah, when he says in verse 36, but of that day and hour, no man know, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. So only God knows. And the reason why only God knows is because when Jesus told his disciples in John, uh, I believe it's 14, let not your heart be troubled. Uh, if you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house is many are many mansions, and I go away to prepare a place for you. Well, Jesus was comforting his disciples and giving them kind of a Jewish wedding scenario, where the groom leaves the bride to go prepare a place for her and for him to live. But usually he goes to his Father's house, and there the Father assists the Son to build his house on the father's property. So Jesus is saying, I'm going away to heaven. In my father's house are many mansions and I'm going to prepare a place for you because when I come get you to be my bride, when I rapture the church, I wanna have everything set up in heaven for you. So that was the scenario. So when uh, Jesus said, no man know the days nor the hour, it's just the father, it's because only the father knew when to tell the son, everything is ready, it's time for you to get your bride, amen. So then Jesus goes on in verse 37 of Matthew 24, and he says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the son of man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all the way. So shall also the coming of the son of man be. So Jesus is hinting that no one knows the day nor the hour, but you have to be like Noah. You have to occupy until Jesus come. You have to be busy about your father's business. You have to be diligent. And in doing that, you are watching, amen, as well as praying so that you are not caught off guard, uh, guard when Jesus cracks the sky and raptures the church. Just like those during Noah's day that were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, they were caught off guard because, amen, they missed uh, the entry into the ark of safety. Amen. And only Noah and his family. Why? Because Noah found grace in God's sight. And now we have found grace in God's sight through his son, Jesus Christ. And because we have received his grace, we need to be at work. We need to be assisting in getting people in the ark of safety, just like Noah did with his family in this era in dispensation of grace. Now, uh, as I stated, uh, this is very important when it comes to end times uh, prophecy, the current events. And I'm gonna take you to Daniel chapter nine, verse 27. 
And, and you'll come to understand why Daniel 9 verse 27 is important. It's part of the 70 weeks prophecy I just mentioned because 69 weeks have already been fulfilled. It was fulfilled at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And when you read Daniel chapter nine, the 70 week prophecy, it would say that Jesus would be crucified at the 69th week. And then there's a gap between the 69th week and the 70th week. And that gap is the church age. Because remember, Daniel was prophesying concerning Israel. And the reason why this dream, or rather this vision came to him, and I forgot to mention it, that when Babylon was overtaken by the Medes and the Persians, remember Babylon is the head of gold, and the Medes and the Persians uh, are uh, the uh, chest and arms of silver, they were the next Gentile nations to take power. So when Belshazzar defiled the uh, vessels of the temple, that's when uh, a hand appeared without an arm and it began to write on the wall, meeny, meeny, tikal up farsin. And that was a judgment that God had found Babylon wanting and that they had judged. And that same night, the Medes and the Persians overtook Babylon. And then Daniel was transported into Persia. And King Darius was the first king during the first rule of Israel being in captivity. And at that time, Daniel was a little perplexed. And the reason for that is because he went to the prophet, the writings of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah was kind of his contemporary, but Daniel was younger uh, than Jeremiah. But he remembered that Jeremiah prophesied of the impending doom of Israel being brought into captivity. So he went to the writings of Jeremiah and, know, and knew that the judgment that came on Israel to be taken into captivity was for 70 years. And the reason for the 70 years is because Israel failed to recognize the Sabbath of the land because it was mandated that every person had to let their land rest every seven years. And because Israel failed to do that for 10 Sabbath years, 10 times seven is 70 years that they were to be in captivity in Babylon. So at the end of the 70 years, Daniel prayed and he said, Lord, 70 years is up. Please reveal your uh, intentions, your will concerning Israel. And that's when he prayed 21 days and fasted and uh, the Prince of Persia tried to stop the angel from getting the message to Daniel, but God said, I heard you the first day. Well, that prophecy is known as Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy when the angel finally told Daniel uh, the prophecy. And it was to let Daniel know that yes, you are out of Babylon after the 70 year period, but now there's 70 weeks of captivity uh, that is determined upon Israel. And these 70 weeks are 70, ye 70 weeks of years. So a week is a, a prophetic week is seven years, one year for each day. So one week is seven years. So if you have 70 prophetic weeks, it's 70 times seven years or 490 years. So now uh, 483 years have already been fulfilled, 69 weeks. Uh, but there are seven more years or one week that still has to be fulfilled. And that will be the tribulation period or Daniel's 70th week. Now I've said all that to say this, Daniel 927 gives us a key as to when the tribulation period will arrive. And it reads, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week 
and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So it's speaking about this covenant. So this covenant is going to be established by a world leader, the Antichrist. And the Antichrist will make this covenant with Israel. That's why it's speaking of the sacrifice and the oblation when he breaks the covenant in the middle of the seven weeks or after three and a half years, that the sacrifice and the oblation. So in other words, this world leader, this antichrist figure at the tribulation period will create or establish a covenant with Israel. Now, what does that have to do with the Middle East? Well, in order for a covenant to be established with the Antichrist and Israel, there must be some things that trigger the need for a covenant or a peace treaty. And what we see today is that Israel in the, is in the midst of a conflict. Now, for those that are just joining us, uh, we're talking about Israel, Hamas, and the end times. And I'm kind of giving you a background to let you know that this conflict or Israel in general is tied to the end times because a covenant must be established between Israel and the Antichrist that will trigger Daniel's 70th week or what we know as the tribulation period. Jeremiah called it the times of Jacob's trouble. Now, again, in order for there to be a need for a covenant or, which is another word for a treaty, a peace treaty, there must be war. So that's why we look at uh, this war going on now uh, in the Middle East, in Israel, between Israel and Hamas. Now, you're probably wondering, well, um, Elder Bradley, why is this so different than any of the other conflicts between Israel and the Palestinians? Well, when we look at this, Israel has not declared war in 50 years. Yes, there have been conflicts and skirmishes, but this is a time is a declaration of war between Hamas. And not only is it a declaration of war, between Israel and Hamas, but it can spill over into a regional war. Now let's identify, everyone knows what is who Israel is, right? Israel is the nation that God established through his uh, servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And through those three fathers, you have the seed of promise. But then you have others that have occupied or lived in the land prior to Israel being reestablished in 1948. Now, remember, when Jesus spoke of the end times in Matthew 24, he also mentioned, amen, about uh, there will come a time where uh, there shall not be left here one stone upon another. Now, Jesus mentioned that, amen, uh, after or, or af during the time the disciples was asking, what are the signs of his coming? So when Jesus prophesied about no, there will, speaking of the temple, there will not be a stone left upon another, uh, that was fulfilled in AD 70 when you had the Roman invasion and they destroyed the temple in AD 70. So technically the end times kind of began then, but it's a progression that leads up to the tribulation period, which is a segment of the end times, right? Because you have the segment, which is during the church age, then you have, because Jesus was speaking to his disciples and other Jews that were there. And so you have the segment, which is pre-tribulation. And then you have the segment that begins 
at the beginning of the tribulation that Jesus refers to, and that's why you have to rightly divide Matthew 24, and then Jesus mentions the abomination that make it desolate. That's the beginning of another segment. That's the second half of the seven year tribulation period. And that's when Jesus said, when you see the abomination that make it desolate. In other words, when the antichrist is possessed with Satan, he breaks the covenant, he then goes to the temple, he proclaims himself to be God, and he may even establish an idol uh, in the temple. And that's when Jesus said, when you see that, flee to the mountains. He says, get out of Dodge, because you don't have time, because the devil knows his time is short. Amen. And unless the Lord shortens the day, no flesh will be saved, the Bible says. So, he says to the disciples, when you see that, go flee to the mountains. If you're in the field, don't come back to the town, to the city. If you're on the rooftop, don't even come down. Jump from rooftop to rooftop to flee to the mountains like Lot did. Amen. Because Satan is coming to destroy Israel. And that's really what's going on now in the Middle East. East. This, when we look at at what's behind the curtains. We know what Paul tells us, that we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood, but, to, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, part of those principalities and powers, God gave us a glimpse in Daniel's day. For that very 70-week prophecy, amen, the angel that was delivering it was, uh, was stopped and delayed by the prince of Persia because they had demonic forces over governments. And God allows it because Satan is the god of this world, small g. So when we look at wars and conflicts and coups and insurrections, we're seeing demonic forces at play. And we also need to keep in mind that despite the, the forces of evil operating as the people of God, we are to be encouraged that all things work together for the good to them that love the Lord and who are the called according to his purpose. Now, when we look at Israel and the reason why Israel is hated so is because the devil really wants to destroy Israel. Why? Because if he can destroy Israel, then he would make God a liar. And if God is a liar, he ceases to be God. But we know that God is not a liar. We know that the devil is the liar. He's the father of lies. The Bible says God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. But Satan wants to destroy Israel. Why? Because if Israel is destroyed, then God's word isn't true. Because God swore to David, he said there will be a king that will sit on the throne of David forever. And that prophecy referred to Jesus, his ultimate rule, a thousand years on the throne. And if Jesus doesn't have a people to rule over, then he's not a king. And therefore that covenant will never be fulfilled. So this is Satan's way of trying to wipe Israel out. And you've heard the Arab nations, how they have declared jihad. They want to wipe Israel off the face of the planet. That is not of God. That is of the devil. Now I know there are some political things and People are saying it's not fair to how the Palestinians are being treated. Well, there's a difference between the people of a nation and its government. Even in America, although we believe that America is the best country on the planet, there are things we don't like in our government, right? Sometimes our government have people that don't mean goodwill. Sometimes you just have evil people in government. But the people, amen, doesn't necessarily match or align with the government. So 
we see that people really are anti-Israel because they look at the policies of its government and they may not agree with it. But that doesn't say or take away anything from the Jewish nation, the people that make up Israel. And the same thing with the Palestinians. Now, the Palestinians, are uh, they are governed by a sect called Hamas. They are the ruling uh, group of leaders that are in the uh, Palestinian territory of the Gaza Strip. Now, if you are old enough, before there was Hamas, there was the Palestinian Authority. And that was under the leadership of um, uh, uh, Asa, not Asa. Oh, my goodness. I, I forgot his name. Uh, Yasser Arafat. That's his name. Yasser Arafat. He was the head of the Palestinian Authority. And there were dealings, like summits. As a matter of fact, after the 1973 war, uh, which was done on Yom Kippur, and it was an invasion by Egypt and other, uh, uh, and I believe Syria came against Israel, and it was a surprise attack. But Israel got the victory. And there was a peace summit between Anwar Sadat of Egypt and Israel. Mahakam Begin. And uh, I believe it was Jimmy Carter that brought the two together and uh, in the 70s. And a peace treaty was established and the Arab world was furious because they don't necessarily want peace. Now, there are some, okay, that do want peace. But in terms of the governments, uh, they don't necessarily want peace. They want to see Israel's demise because there is principality and powers, uh, things uh, or forces behind behind them. Uh, and they may not even realize that they're being used by the enemy, but such is the case. So getting back to the Palestinian Authority, over time, uh, the, the leaders of the Palestinian Authority have lost their clout because there's been back and forth, there's been skirmishes and conflicts, and now it's under the leadership of uh, Abbas, is his last name. But since Abbas became the leader of the Palestinian Authority, Israel has been dealing with a more radical faction of the Palestinians, uh, and that is where you get Hamas. And what's different now is that, yes, Hamas uh, and Israel would be in conflict. Sometimes there'll be rockets. You know, it's almost like it's, uh, you know, how it used to be where um, you would have organized crime against the police. You know, organized crime would allow the police every now and then to have a few busts, right? Just to make sure things, so the police don't look like they're on the take. So organized crime would allow them to raid their number holes, number spots, Oh, but y'all don't know anything about that because uh, y'all don't play the numbers. Amen. Y'all don't play lottery and Powerball. Amen. You've been saved all your life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But yeah, that was an arrangement. And it was kind of like the arrangement between Israel and the Palestinian Authority or, or Hamas. They would enter into these conflicts uh, and these rocket firings, but it would be nothing major. But now the tide has changed, and this is a major uh, assault uh, that occurred from Hamas against Israel. And it occurred on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And I've often taught about the seven feasts of the Lord. These are holy days. These are important days. And although the Feast of Tabernacles is a time of celebration, it was still nevertheless a solemn and sacred day that, as a matter of fact, out of all the feasts, the, the only remaining feast that will be in existence when Jesus sets up his kingdom is going to be the Feast of Tabernacles. And I believe it's in Zechariah where it's written that if the people do not come to worship, G, to worship in the mountain and, and, and worship the Lord, uh, 
for the Feast of Tabernacles because Tabernacles means that Jesus or God is tabernacling. He's living, he's dwelling with the people the way he did in the wilderness. They dwelt in huts and booths and Jesus was in the midst of the camp. He was tabernacling. The presence of God was in the tabernacle. So Jesus will represent or be the fulfillment of the tabernacle and this feast day will occur every year and their nations will be required to come to Jerusalem to uh, commemorate and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And if they don't, you know what? They won't receive any rain because we're gonna go back to an agrarian or agricultural society. There'll be no more need for computers and all that other stuff, technology. Amen. Uh, no more hoarding and greed, right? Because Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years and dropped in the bottomless pit. So capitalism will be out the window. Communism will be out the window. Marxism out the All these man-made systems of government and Jesus will be ruling in everlasting righteousness. So the Feast of Tabernacles was a very important day of celebration. And that's when Hamas chose to attack Israel. And of course, Israel was caught off guard because you're celebrating the goodness of God. Jehovah, Yahweh, you're celebrating the God of Israel. And they did a sneak attack. And the way they did it was so sophisticated, it was known that they had to have help, had help from some other power. Now, when we look at this war that Israel has declared, I mentioned that it may spill over to a regional war because it's not just Hamas that's in the picture, but there's the threat from the north with Hezbollah. And Hezbollah uh, is in Lebanon. That is where the uh, nation of Tyre was, a Canaanite nation. Now, remember, all of this we, we have to see whether it's going to trigger the need for a covenant between Israel and this world leader. We don't know yet, but we have to watch, as Jesus says. That's why it's important not to stick our head in the sand like an ostrich. I know we don't like to look at the violence and we don't like to look um, at the conflict. I know we just want to shout and speak in tongues. But you know what? It's also about knowing the times that you're in so that you don't miss the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in the rapture. Now, we have to know whether or not uh, this is going to spill over into the other neighborhoods of the region because Israel is surrounded by other nations. Now, when we look at Psalms 83, Psalms 83 is prophetic because it deals with these nations in the region or these peoples, not so much nations, but these peoples in the region of Israel, surrounding Israel, this is a prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. Why? Because all of the in, all the individual uh, peoples that are named have not attacked Israel at once. And if you look at Psalm 83, it tells us that these nations, and I don't want to call them nations because they're not nations. Uh, and, and that's why it's also important to distinguish Psalms 83 in contrast to the Battle of Armageddon, because Armageddon is going to be against superpowers. All nations led by superpowers are going to is going to occur at the Battle of Armageddon. That's Ezekiel 38 and 39. And it is my belief that that occurs toward the end of the tribulation period, the last half. And I don't have time to go into Armageddon, but they involve different nations at the forefront, namely Russia. And I'm going to touch on that 
But right now, if we go to Psalm 83, this was a psalm by Asaph, who was a Levite, who was skilled, a skilled musician. And he wrote this song, and it was prophetic. And if you read, let's start at verse 1. It says, Keep not thy keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. Now here Asaph in the song is saying they hate God, right? These are the Lord's enemies because they hate God. That's nothing but the devil behind the hate. And they have taken crafty counsel against thy people, meaning Israel, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. So when you hear these nations saying, we want to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, this is that's that's what this scripture is talking about. And it says, for they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. So in other words, all these groups of people that are in Psalms 83 are joining together. And it becomes a regional conflict with Israel in the middle surrounded. Now, we know Israel is a nuclear power. We know uh, Israel is backed by the United States. So therefore, they have arms, they have missiles, and a limited supply. So Israel can, um, it was said that if Israel goes into a ground invasion, which they said they will definitely do, the Israeli Defense Force, IDF, they said there will be a ground invasion. And what will happen is Hezbollah, which is in North Lebanon, in the North in Lebanon, they said if that happens, then that's when we're going to jump in the war. Now, Hezbollah is a Shiite people. And Hamas are Sunni Muslims. Hezbollah are Shiite. And I talked about the difference last week, I think two weeks ago. Uh, but both of them are getting support from Iran because Iran is a superpower using these two lesser groups to go against Israel as a proxy because Iran can't have a direct confrontation against Israel because then that will automatically trigger a war between Iran and the United States, which Iran does not want to happen. But both of these groups, Hezbollah and Hamas, who are all enemies of Israel, backed by Iran, Hezbollah is the more powerful of the two. They get arms directly from Iran and supplies. And they have thousands of rockets and missiles that they can launch. So this is a very uh, dire circumstance uh, and situation that can trigger um, this conflict, this type of war that will cause a global leader to come on the scene, this antichrist figure to establish this peace covenant between Israel and these reason, regional uh, groups of people. Now, when we look at Psalms 83, there these are the names of the people that, uh, that are uh, um, the groups that are named. Edom, Ishmaelites, Moab, the Hagarines, Gibal, Ammon, Amalek, the Philistines, Tyre, Asher. Now I'm going to go just briefly into those groups so you can identify who these people are in the region. Now, what we're dealing with 
when we talking about the enemies of Israel, it uh, is a two layered uh, or two tiered hatred. The first layer of hatred has to do with a family infighting. These are ancient vendettas between these groups against Israel. Why? Because Abraham had the son had a son by Hagar who was an Egyptian. Ishmael was born, the firstborn of Abraham. Then came Isaac, the seed of promise. And then after Isaac, when Sarah died, Abraham married Keturah and has six sons. And then after Isaac had married Rebekah, he had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Esau was rejected. Jacob, the blessing came through. And then he had 12 sons that made up Israel. But all of them lay claim to the land of Canaan. But the Palestinian covenant was given to the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's why it's important. In order to be of the promise, you had to be a descendant from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be a Jew or to be an Israelite. Jew, the name Jew came later from the tribe of Judah. But to be an Israelite, you had to be a descendant from the 12 tribes. So now you have Ishmael and Esau. So when you look at the first group of people, it says Edom. That's Esau. Esau's name was changed to Edom because Edom meant red. And we know that when Esau was born, he was red. So Esau is Edom. And that is the brother of Jacob. So it's family, right? They lived in southern Israel because when they came out of the wilderness, uh, uh, when they came out of uh, Egypt, rather, and entered into the wilderness, who attacked them? Amalek. Now, we're going to go into who Amalek is. But Edom or Esau dwelled in the south. And even as Israel was marching toward Mount Seir, the Lord told Israel, that's the land I gave Esau. Leave him alone. So southern Israel is Edom and parts of Jordan. So if you know of the nation of Jordan, that is part Esau territory. Now, Jordan is kind of in an, an ally of the United States, but Lately, out of this war, Jordan has been kind of shake, a little shaky there. Then you have the Ishmaelites that are named. And we know that Ishmael, uh, the son of firstborn of, of Isaac, they are associated with Yemen. You heard of Yemen, right? Kind of in uh, the southern part of Saudi Arabia the Ishmaelites. Also, Midian came out of Ishmael. Jethro was a, the father-in-law of Moses was a Midianite. So Yemen, the other day, shot rockets into, toward Israel and the United States having a uh, air force, uh, aircraft carrier shot the missiles down. So there's, there's, a potential for Yemen to enter into the fight because they're Shia. Now, going back to, and, and, and I know this is a lot of information, but we're talking, you know, Shia and Sunni, they're all Muslims. Matter of fact, let me hold off on that. What I was talking about is the family dispute. There's family vendettas, and then there's the second tier of conflict between Israel and her enemies is because of being Jewish versus being Islamic. Because if you're not an is if you're not a Muslim, then you're an infidel. 
and you're worthy of death. So there's a hatred on two levels because of the family vendetta and because of the difference in religions, Islam versus the Jew, Judaic tradition or religion. In Islam, you have two major factions. You have Shia and Sunni. Hamas is Sunni. Hezbollah is Shia. The Yemenites are Shia. Um, I'm sorry. Hamas is Sunni. Hezbollah is Shia. Yemen is Shia. Now, the Arab nations like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and United Arab Emirates, Dubai, those nations, those Arab nations, they are Sunni Muslims. And you know them by the headdress, right? The white headdress with that drapes down with the band. And you, when you see it, you think everybody's a sheik. Well, those are the Sunni Muslims. The Shia, like the Ayatollahs in Iran, they wear different garments. They're usually wrapped in black robes and they have turbans. Now, don't confuse them with the Indian uh, religion because sometimes Indians are attacked because they wear turbans too, but they're not Muslim. They're Hindu. Sh the Shia um, are like led by the Ayatollahs. And Iran is a superpower of the Shia faction of Islam. Now, why are there two factions? It goes back to Muhammad, the, their prophet. After his death, there were two families that wanted one of their family members to succeed Muhammad. And there was an infighting. And uh, one of them assassinated the other potential successor to be the caliph. The, their caliph um, is their, lead, their spiritual leader. As a matter of fact, they are looking for their caliph to appear, but they don't know their caliph that finally is going to uh, appear is going to be the Antichrist. Or if you're not looking for Jesus, then you're looking for the Antichrist. And you have all these religions, except for the Christians who are looking for Jesus to come. These other religions are looking for their leader, but they're going to get the Antichrist because there's no other name given under heaven whereby a man must be saved, but by the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So you have this now infighting among the in the Islamic world between Shia and Sunni. There are schisms there. But when it comes to Israel, they are united. The, it, your, the, enemy, the enemy of my enemy is what? My friend is the same. So we have, even though Hamas is Sunni, they are still getting backing from Iran that's Shia because their enemy is Israel. So let's get back to the list. We mentioned Edom is Esau, the Ishmaelites, which is associated with Yemen in Saudi Arabia, off of the south part of Saudi Arabia, was the firstborn of Abraham. Then we have Moab is mentioned in Psalm 83. That's one of Lot's sons. And the Moabites, right? Ruth was a Moabite. She was a Gentile. Married Boaz. Boaz begat Obed. Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. And David was the king whose descendancy will bring forth the Messiah, Jesus Christ. You see how this is tied together? But Moab was a son of Lot when his daughter slept with him because their men stayed in Sodom and Gomorrah when it was destroyed. They got their father drunk and they he brought two sons by the name of Moab and Ammon. Now, Ammon is also listed in Psalm 83. See that family vendetta here in relationship? So you got Moab and Ammon both associated with the nation of Jordan. 
the Ammonites and the Moabites in Jordan. And we talked about Jordan. Then you have the Hagarenes. We know that Hagar was in Egypt. So we got people in Egypt of the Hagarenes that don't like Israel. Remember, Egypt attacked uh, Israel with Syria in the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Then you have Gibal mentioned. That is also in the land of Esau, in the Negev, which is southern Israel. Then we talked about Ammon, and then Amalek, right? We talked about Amalek. Amalek was the grandson of Esau. Esau begat Eliphaz, and Eliphaz begat Amalek. Amalek has been at war with Israel since day one, when they snuck attack Israel after they came up out of the Red Sea. And God smote Amalek and swore that he would wipe their name out of heaven. But we know what would happen. There was disobedience by King Saul, and he let King Agag live. And as a result, you had the Agagites that continued the sons of Amalek and we see an Agagite appear during the time of Esther. Haman was an Agagite. He wanted to do what? Wipe Israel off the map. Oh, glory be to God. So the devil has been trying to wipe Israel out since day one because he knows what God has spoken in the future. He knows his future and he's trying to change it. But God already spoke it and it will not return unto him void. So Haman and his family were put to death. That's why you have the Feast of Purim. It's a celebration. And the fulfillment of Purim is going to come. I can't get too I'll be here all night. That will be fulfilled after the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ because the devil will be loosed out of the bottomless pit and he will lead a charge against those who were born during the millennial kingdom that haven't been tested yet. And Satan will deceive them and try to wipe out Israel once again under the rule though of Jesus Christ. That will be the last rebellion. See, because the Feast of Purim is the last feast. Now it's not a feast of like the seven feasts of the Lord, but it is a feast of Israel that occurs right before the spring. So at the last rebellion, when the enemy is actually defeated, the devil and his angels and unbelievers are thrown in the bottomless pit, then that's when you get the beginning of springtime again, which will be eternity future. Oh, glory, hallelujah when we will be in the holy city, New Jerusalem. Glory be to God. Oh, I feel hallelujah like shouting right now, just thinking what the end is gonna be. Oh, hallelujah. So Amalek, Vendetta, then you have the Philistines. We know about the Philistines. They were a thorn in Israel's side for millennia. Right, even starting with the book of Judges, had an encounter with Samson. Even with Saul and David, the Philistines, Goliath was a Philistine. All these are the enemies of Israel, but they're coming together in confederate. Tyre, descendants of Canaan in Lebanon. Remember, remember the cedars of Lebanon that David uh, purchased from Hiram? in order so that Solomon could build the temple? Well, at one time they were friends, Tyre. But also Tyre had some issues. And if you read in Ezekiel, I believe Ezekiel 36, when it speaks about the king of Tyre and he's associated with Lucifer because Tyre was lifted up in pride, so was Lucifer. And God was gonna bring Tyre down. Well, Tyre is Lebanon, Hezbollah, Tyre. And then Aser is named. Aser was, was the progenitor of the Assyrians. And there, and the Assyrian Empire 
was the empire that brought the captivity of the northern tribes. They carried them away captive as a result of their backsliders. The, remember, because it was split Israel, 10 tribes to the north, two tribes to the south. And Assyria carried the northern tribes into captivity. They were an enemy. God sent Jonah to preach to Nineveh. You remember, Jonah was like, no way, Jose. I'm getting on a, the next boat out and going to Tarshish. And the Lord said, uh-uh, no, you're not. Because Jonah didn't want his enemies. One, he feared his enemies. And two, he didn't want God's mercies to be upon them. He didn't want them to repent. But nonetheless, we know that the Lord prepared a whale, swallowed Jonah, spit him out. He was glad to preach then. And Nineveh repented. But then later, we see that Nahum, the prophet, prophesied against them because of their destruction. They backslid. So we have these groups of people that are in the region surrounding Israel. And there's a potential for this prophecy to come to pass if this war happens to spill over. If we see Hezbollah from the north in Tyre come into play, if we see Yemen that's in the southern part of uh, Saudi Arabia come into play. Now, the reason why this, this Psalm 83 prophecy is not the battle of Armageddon because Armageddon has different players because we're talking about them, or they're the superpowers in Ezekiel 38, 39. And they will be led by Russia in Armageddon. But that happens in the second half of the tribulation period. That's not Psalms 83. Psalms 83, if it becomes a regional war, could be the trigger, as I mentioned to you, of that Antichrist covenant where a global leader will step into place and make an agreement between Israel and all of these other regional confederates. But if that happens, the rapture will take place before that covenant is established. Because we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture not a mid-tribulation rapture and not a post-tribulation rapture where some people believe in. We believe, I believe, that Jesus will come for the church before this covenant is established. The reason why is because if you believe that the Lord is coming in the middle of the tribulation, you know the time. All you got to do is count three and a half years, or as the Bible says, 1260 days from the time the covenant is established. And you know when Jesus is coming. So why watch? Why live right? Just repent at the last minute. And the post-tribulation view, the same thing. You know that when the abomination of desolation occurs, we know that that's exactly three and a half years after the tribulation begins. So all you got to do is count three and a half years after that for Jesus to return with his white horse. That's why those views don't hold water. The pre-tribulation view is the only view that aligns with Jesus saying, no man knows the day nor the hour. Almost like it coincides with the Feast of Trumpets. Right, Because the Feast of Trumpets, I taught this, is the only feast that occurs on the first day of the month, the seventh month on the first day. All the other feasts are on other days, like Passover is on the 14th day, uh, unleavened bread, 15th day, first fruits, 16th day of the month of Nisan. But when we look at the Feast of Trumpets, it's on the first day of the seventh month. Why is that important? Because the month always began with the new moon. So therefore, there had to be witnesses to watch 
the breaking of the new moon. That's why the rapture is associated with the Feast of Trumpets, because only those that watch for the coming of the Lord, because they don't know when the new moon is going to appear until they see it in the sky. You, we won't know. We we don't know when the Lord is coming, but if we're watching, we're going to see. We're going to hear the shout of the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and we'll be in the rapture. But that's only pre-tribulation. Amen. So, getting back to Armageddon. Armageddon happens after the three and a half year period. That's why this is not Armageddon. I want to. Put your fears to rest. This is not Armageddon because one, the tribulation hasn't started and the tri tribulation after three and a half years, then toward the end of the next three and a half years, the battle of Armageddon occurs because Israel, um, Russia, which is in the north, if you read Ezekiel 38, they join hands with other Arab nations. And in the Battle of Armageddon, it's led by the land of Magog. And if you look on a map, directly north of Israel is Russia. And if you know anything about the sons of Japheth, the names that are named like Goma and Togomar, Meshach and Tubal, those are old Soviet Union nations. If you go to Genesis, I believe it's chapter 10. And look at the table of nations. The first son that is named is Japheth, one of the sons of Noah. And in verse two, the sons of Japheth, Goma and Magog, Medei and Javan and Tubal and Meshach and Tyrus, and the sons of Goma, Ashkenaz, Rithab and Togomar. Now Ashkenaz are associated with, the, with Ukraine. Right? You got Ashkenazi Jews. The Orthodox Jews that you see with the dark hats, especially if you're from the East Coast and you see them in Israel, they're Ashkenazi. They're the descendants of Gomer, son of Japheth. They originated in Ukraine, which was once part of the old Soviet Union. So now what's going to happen is. Russia is now is in an expensive war with Ukraine and they are draining their resources. He, Putin didn't count on the Ukraine fighting back the way they did. Some strategists believe that he thought the Ukrainians was going to just lay down their weapons and welcome them with open arms, but that didn't happen. And they have the backing of the U.S. So now Russia is expending billions to fight this war with Ukraine. They are depleting their resources. Now, when we get to the Armageddon battle, Gog, who's the chief prince of Magog, he's going to look, if you read Ezekiel 38 and 39, he's going to look at Israel as prey. Why? Because Israel right now has oil and gas. As a matter of fact, they have an agreement to transport gas to Europe that happened not too long ago. And they're going to come against Israel to take uh, the spoils of Israel. The way Ahab and Jezebel try, did it to Naboth. <sighs> Wish I had time. Uh, because Naboth was near the Valley of Jezreel, which is going to be the site of the Battle of Armageddon. They're going to come from the north, Russia, along with the other European, Eastern European nations, the former Soviet Union bloc, because that's Putin's ultimate goal, is to bring Russia and the other nations that, when Soviet Union was broken apart, wants to bring it together to the old Soviet Union. And when they come, they're going to come not just with all of Eastern Europe, like Georgia and Armenia, which is Meshach and Tubal, but they're going to join an alliance with Persia, 
which is modern day Iran, Ethiopia, which is a primarily Muslim nation, and Libya, which is in Northern Africa, another Islamic nation. But those are superpowers, not the nation, not the people of Psalm 83. Psalm 83 are groups of people related to Israel that are their enemies. But I believe that war, if it escalates, may trigger uh, a covenant and the Antichrist will come into power as a result of this treaty. So that's why we ought to watch. Amen. Uh, don't be fearful of the current events. And I know I'm going over time. Amen. I can be, I can talk all night regarding uh, the end times, but I think we need to be aware of the times that we're living in because we're in the last of the last days. And I know people often say we are. Uh, and the Lord, uh, you know, you said 9-11, the Lord was coming. Or you said, you know, even earlier than that, the Lord was. Well, when you look at what's going on in the world today, you have to look at the frequency, the birth pangs, how they're coming. Like you're in labor, the pangs are coming with greater frequency and closer in time. That's how you know the, 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 what's about to be birth is going to occur. You're seeing more earthquakes. There, were, there, there was an earthquake, a major earthquake in uh, Afghanistan. A couple of thousand people perished. Earthquake in uh, Morocco. And then one was in Libya. So they're happening global warming with the seas roaring. I believe Luke 21 speaks about those things. But Jesus said, don't be discouraged. Don't fear. Look up because your redemption draweth nigh. And I think I'm going to end it right there. And I'm going to have uh, an opportunity for you to ask any questions you may have in the comment section. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are there any questions? Thank you, Lord. Are you still with me? Amen. Thank those that uh, took the time to join us on tonight. I see uh, Sister Brantley Porter. Uh, is online. I see Sister Alston. All of my uh, usual supporters are here. I see Deacon Barnes. Uh, God bless you, sir. Uh, I see Elder Stokes. God bless you. Uh, Brother LZ Washington, always good to see you. I see uh, Sister Betty Kitching. Sister Cynthia Caldwell, God bless you. Thank you for joining in. Uh, Sister Teresa Gordon, God bless you. Uh, I see uh, Brother Michael Knight, my nephew. Amen. That's uh, on the line. All right. I appreciate you all for supporting In Heavenly Places and uh, tuning in to this lesson. Are there any questions or comments? Feel free to type it into the box. Amen. God bless you, uh, Sister Farris uh, Coxon. Amen. Glad to see you there. Any questions or comments? Well, I, hearing none, I, I guess uh, everything was uh, received well, well received and explained. If there's no other questions. All right. Well, hearing none, let us uh, end uh, with a word of prayer. Uh, Brother Austin is asking, will there be a part two? Well, uh, let's 
pray about it and see if uh, God leads me in, in that direction. Uh, God bless you, Sister Gillespie. What is the name of your and what is your mail address? Uh, well, you, if you want to write, you can do so um, in Heavenly Places, Elder Marcus Brantley. Uh, that's P.O. Box. Uh, I'm sorry, not P.O. Box. That's uh, 975 East Riggs Road, Suite 12 170, Chandler, Arizona, 85249. Again, in Heavenly Places, Elder Marcus Brantley, 975 East Riggs Road, Suite 12 170, Chandler, Arizona, 85249. And uh, thank you, Sister Gordon. God bless you as well. Uh, you, you have a question. Please type it in the comments. That's right, Sister Bradley Porter. If the rapture doesn't come first, then we can't do a part two. But the rapture can happen anytime. Amen. Can happen tonight if God will so wills it. Because there's nothing uh, pertaining to the rapture that has not been fulfilled. Uh, it would be uh, Elder Marcus Brantley, Sister Gillespie. Uh, Sister Gordon, you said, can you put it in the comments? Are you referring to the address? Okay. Amen. That's the address. All right. My question is, did we supposed to keep, I think maybe part of your questions was cut off. Sister Gordon. Okay. Amen. All right. Well, amen. Uh, we're going to bring it to a close. Amen. We're going to have more of these uh, teaching lessons and uh, Q&A. So uh, next time, I, I want you all to bring your, your questions so that um, uh, we can uh, attempt to, to answer it. Um, even if it's off topic, uh, but we would like to keep it on topic. But anything concerning end times, eschatology, uh, I will welcome uh, the questions. Amen. Well, let's uh, begin uh, or rather end with a word of prayer. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we thank you. We praise you. We magnify your name. Lord, we give you glory and honor. We thank you, Lord, for what's been said and done. Even, Lord, we thank you for your word. For your word is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. Now, Father, help us, O oh God, to meditate on your word, O oh God, even day and night, that we may be like the tree planted by the rivers of water, giving fruit in its due season. Father, we ask that you bless each and every hearer of this lesson. Give us understanding, O oh God. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. 
And Father God, we ask that you help us to be ready. Oh God, help us to watch as well as pray. For we know not the hour that the Son of Man cometh. But Lord, if we watch, we will not be overtaken by like a thief in the night. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, count us worthy to escape the wrath that is to come upon this world. Bless each and every household, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. If there's any sick, touch their bodies. Oh God, in Jesus' name, we ask these blessings. Amen and amen. Well, once again, God bless you. God willing, hope to see you next Sunday in Heavenly Places with Elder Marcus Bradley. Have a good night. Rest for sleep. In Jesus' name. Shalom. Shalom. Please share. Amen. So that others can hear this message. Will you do that? Hit the share button. God bless you.